Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us over your lunch hour today for another one of our business growth luncheons in partnership with Economic Development Regina and the NSBA. Uh, my name is Ali Ramsey, West Communications Coordinator and Executive Assistant. And I also want to give a big shout out to today's webinar sponsor, Peter Lucas Project Management. So thank you to them. Our topic today is a very timely one. It is tax preparation for small businesses and is presented by Carly Barker and Damara Casper of MNP. So if you have any questions for either of them as we go through the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box, uh, not the regular chat box, there is a Q&A box down there, and we will get to questions after the presentation. However, uh, please put your name, where you're from, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your business in the regular chat box as well. And as always, this webinar, it is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing by the end of today. And you will receive an email tomorrow at this time with a link to the recording. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Carly and Damara now to begin their presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, maybe Carly, can you let me know if you can see my screen? Yes, I can see it on my end. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's another chilly one in Saskatchewan. And so we're happy to be here to present this webinar on tax preparation for small businesses. And so as Ali introduced, uh, I am Damara Casper and I'm joined today with Carly Barker. Uh, we're both with MMP and we both work in the private enterprise space in the MMP Saskatoon office. Uh, what that means really is that Carly and I both work with small to medium sized businesses in a variety of industries and we help our clients with their corporate and personal tax needs on a daily basis. We also are part of the WESC All Access sessions as well. So those are monthly sessions uh, that we join and we help answer some questions to entrepreneurs on that monthly basis. So our presentation today, we're gonna look at um, some business structures. We're gonna look at choosing a year end if you're incorporated, some compensation discussions. We'll look at some common deductions. And then we're also gonna look at some other important considerations as well. So business structures. And my apologies, I forgot to also say, as Ali mentioned, we will have questions. Uh, we'll answer those at the, at the end. So please feel free to put those in the Q&A &A box, like Ali mentioned, and we'll be happy to, happy to answer those at the end. I'm pretty sure we've got some time uh, for questions there. Okay, so business structures. So some of the three main business structures uh, that we see is sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. And all of these business structures, they really have different advantages and disadvantages to them. And it really comes down to how to make your business, you know, the most profitable and successful, you know, in the best structure that's going to fit for you and your fact pattern. And with the proper advice and structuring that can really help your business grow and succeed to its utmost potential. So what does a sole proprietorship really mean? Well, that really is just an extension of you as an individual. You have a calendar year end, so you're going to report your income and your expenses from January 1st to December 31st. This income gets reported on your personal tax return on a T2125 statement of business or professional activities. You have a CPP requirement as a sole proprietor, but you're not covered by employment insurance. And as a sole proprietor, you can pay employees, you would issue those employees a T4 slip, but you as a business owner don't receive a T4 slip. So really what that means is that you are earning all your income on your personal tax return. And so that is you taking out the cash on a regular basis. There's no way to actually report that on a slip for you. 
If you are a sole proprietor, you obviously at the start out of your business, you may incur some losses and that is absolutely okay. You can do that as a sole proprietor, your losses can be used against all your types of income, which is a differentiation from if you're incorporated. And we'll talk about that in an upcoming slide. You can carry your losses back three years or you can carry them forward. But really to highlight that, you know, you might be like, oh, I've incurred all these expenses and I did not have enough income. I don't think that I can report that. You absolutely can. CRA expects that you're going to not be profitable in your first, you know, couple of years, or you may not be profitable. The, there, is a, there is an expectation of profit for sure, but it, it does make sense that you would have losses and it's not a bad thing to have that. And then as a sole proprietor, you really have the option to incorporate in the future. And this is really a planning opportunity. So when you really start to see that you are, you know, making, you know, 100,000, 150,000, you know, if you are able to not, you're not pulling all those funds out, you might want to have that conversation with your advisor to say, is this now the time for me to incorporate? And really that's because you're earning all this income on your personal tax return and you might be paying higher rates than you could if you were incorporated. But I want to highlight, this is a very individual decision. You might have colleagues, you might have different individuals in the same industry as you that they've incorporated already. But that not, may not be the best decision for you. And that is a separate decision, separate fact pattern for you as an individual to decide when the best time is for you to incorporate. So what are some important deadlines? Obviously, this is something that catches many people off guard, especially you know, you're excited to get a business going. And you kind of forget, well, what are those deadlines? What does that look like? So as a sole proprietor, again, you are still reporting your income and your expenses on your personal tax return. So if you have taxes owing, they will be due April 30th. That does not change. What does change is that now that you have that 2125 business schedule, your tax returns are actually due June 15th. But again, if you have taxes owing, it's due April 30th. So don't get caught by that thinking that you've got June 15th, I can file my taxes owing, I can pay them by June 15th. Not the case, you will get charged penalties and interest. So keep that in mind. And then as a sole proprietor, you may also have quarterly installment requirements. And those happen on the 15th of March, June, September, and December. Really, there's a lot of information on this slide. You're, gonna, you're seeing a lot of different brackets and you're seeing percentages here and don't wanna overwhelm anybody. And many of you may already be aware of this, but just wanted to highlight the 2022 personal tax rates. We are part of a marginal tax rate system. And that really just means that you're paying $1 um, on every dollar that you earn over, over your tax. Sorry, let me start that again. You're paying um, tax on the next dollar of income. So if you earn $100,000, you're not paying 100,000 at the 33%. You are only paying the 33% from the 50 to the 100. So just to highlight here, you know, as you become more profitable with your business, you can see that those tax rates, they really start to climb. And so when you're making it upwards of, you know, 100,000, 150,000, that's where it may make sense to incorporate and pay tax at the lower rates. And we'll talk about incorporation coming up. Another piece to highlight is just, you know, as you're a sole proprietor, and if you do have a high amount of personal tax income, and you are part of one of these social programs, so um, EI, if you're receiving the age credit or old age security, they do have a means test and they do have a clawback. So these are just the thresholds here, um, where if you're exceeding this income, it starts to be clawed back and you will pay back some of that social program, the social benefit that you've already received. And at certain thresholds, those get cut back completely. So now you've made that decision and it's time to incorporate. Now what? Well, you can roll over your business assets into the corporation on a tax deferred basis. So that is something you can talk to your advisor about. And so if you have you know, computers, maybe you're a photographer and you've got some pretty expensive um, photography assets and, and cameras, those things can be rolled into your business on a tax deferred basis. And so you're bringing those in now into your corporation and they'll be used by your corporation. I encourage you to talk to a legal professional and make sure that you're setting up the business appropriately. 
And that includes the share structure options. So with the federal elections a number of years, federal election a number of years back, um, the opportunity for income splitting really was minimized, but there is still opportunities and things to think about. And that's where a legal and an accountant can talk to you about the share structure and who best should be the shareholders in your business and how to set that up appropriately for possible future income splitting or possible growth for the business going forward. And another key highlight here, when you incorporate, you really wanna open that corporate bank account and have a corporate credit card. As an incorporated business, you want all of your income expenses to be running through the corporate bank account. You should be paying for things with your corporate credit card and really running that all through your incorporated business. Okay, what about a partnership? So partnerships come in many different forms. Um, it can be two or more individuals, or it can be one or more companies. And a partnership is not a taxable entity. So a partnership is not filing um, a tax, per, tax return per se. The income isn't taxed in the partnership. That income is really allocated at the partnership level and allocated down to the partners. So if you are an individual, if there's only individuals in the partnership, you're just gonna pick up that partnership income and expenses on your personal tax return. And if you're a corporated, um, part, if, you're part, if you're a corporation and you're a part of the partnership, you're going to receive a T5013 slip. So another T slip that gets picked up uh, by the corporation. Okay, another big topic here is, is being a corporation. Well, as a corporation, you are a separate legal entity. So the assets of the company are limited to the company. And that's one of the reasons that we see some of our entrepreneurs incorporating. They really don't want that liability to extend to them personally. So by doing that, their assets are now protected in the company. And that just, you know, helps them sleep better at night that, you know, nothing is going to come back towards them personally on their own personal assets. Uh, net income is active. If it is active for tax purposes, the tax rate is nine and a half percent for 2022 on your first $500,000 of taxable income. So you can see there is a, a, a nice tax savings here, but I want to highlight the tax rates of a corporation obviously are lower, but if you earn all of your income in a corporation and you pull all of that income out in the same year, you will pay the same amount of tax, whether you earned it personally and were taxed in your personal tax return or if you earned it in the company. And really at the end of the day, you will pay the same amount of tax, whether you earned your income personally or by the corporation. The corporation just allows you to defer those taxes and to be taxed when and by whom at a, at a different time. So that's really the key piece there. And Saskatchewan does have a um, income tax bracket between 500,000 and 600,000, but then anything over 500,000 is taxed at 27%. And you can obviously have investment income. You can have marketable securities in your corporation. And those are taxed at a different rate. So they aren't taxed at the nine and a half percent. They are actually taxed at 50.67% on everything other than dividends. So the flexibility of a corporation actually allows you to determine how to pay yourself. And you can do that via salary or dividend or a combination of both. And Carly's gonna talk about that in her slides coming up. And so again, income splitting has sort of been limited, but again, there is a possibility um, depending on your, your situation and how the corporation is set up that there may be some opportunity there for you. As a corporation, um, if you are paying a salary, you are paying the employer employee portion of CPP. So that is a tax cost to the company and maybe one of the reasons that you don't pay a salary. And again, sort of like the sole proprietorship as an owner, of a corporation, you're not covered by employment insurance. One of the nice things that we'll talk about coming up is that there are some planning opportunities when you choose a year end for your corporation. And you can kind of time your personal income inclusion. So you might have a June 30th year end, and you might want to split your income between, say, 2022 and 2023. Well, there are ways to do that, you know, with accruing bonuses or, um, you know, with deferring how we're going to set that up. And so those are things that we can plan with you when we've got the corporation. 
Again, as I mentioned, you know, corporations have those lower tax rates for income that's retained in the business. There are limited tax benefits, again, if income is flowed all the way out to the individual. And then as a corporation, you do have additional costs, being your legal and your professional fees. So you will file an annual return legally, and that's about $300, $350. And then you'll have accounting fees to prepare your financial statements. Uh, you might have a bookkeeper. Those are different things that are going to add up as well. And then also, if you are paying salary or dividends, you have a T-slip filing requirement, and that is due February 28th of each year. And that's just another compliance piece that you'll have by uh, being an owner of a corporation. Some other opportunities as a corporation is that you may have the ability in the future to sell your business and you might be able to sell your shares. And that gives you the opportunity to qualify possibly for the lifetime capital gains exemption. And Carly's gonna talk about that coming up as well. As I mentioned earlier too, um, the sole proprietorship can use their losses against all sorts of income on your personal tax return. And I mentioned that the company really is different in that aspect. And that's where if you have a, a non-capital loss for the business, that loss can be carried for 20 years or carried back three years. And so, you know, maybe in 2021, you had a loss, but 2020, you had income. Well, you can carry that loss back and recoup some of those taxes that you would have paid in that year. But what's different with the corporation is that if you have a capital loss, that capital loss can only be used against capital, capital gains. So just some differences there that you see between the sole proprietorship and the, and the corporation. Just like we saw with the sole proprietor, there is important filing requirements and deadlines for a corporation. So as a corporation, depending on your year end, you have the filing of the tax return is due six months after year end. So if you choose a June 30th year end, your tax return is due December 31st. Your tax filings, depending on certain criteria, can be due two months or three months after your end. So that is when your taxes owing would be due. Again, as I mentioned as well, if you've got T4s or T5s, those are due February 28th of each year. And if you've got taxable income that has exceeded a threshold of $3,000, you might have installment requirements. And as it, depending on the amount of tax that you've paid um, and your taxable income, your installment requirements could be monthly or quarterly. And this slide here, I just wanted to highlight for everybody again, you know, sort of side by side, what are those differences between the proprietorship and the corporation? Okay, so what about this choosing a year end that I mentioned? What does that look like? So again, it's really just choosing the opportunity not to have a calendar year end if that doesn't work for your business. When you incorporate, you get to choose what year end makes sense for your business. So if your business is busy during the summer, you maybe don't want to have a year end that falls during the summer because you're not going to want to be trying to get your books ready for the year end to give to your accountant. If you're trying at your busiest time just to be profitable at most, you know, busiest time of your year. So you can choose that different count, that different uh, fiscal year end. And in that first year, you have up to 53 weeks. Uh, your, your, your corporate year end can be up to 53 weeks. So you've got some opportunity and flexibility there to really choose it your end that makes sense. And again, you might decide that if you incorporate in March, that you're going to choose a December year end. So you might have this short year end. So your first tax return that you would file would be from March until December 31st. You are not stuck to the year end that you choose when you incorporate. There is the opportunity to change that year end if your business uh, requirements change. Maybe you become a partner in a partnership and you want to align with that partner's year end. And so that is something you can do. It just requires a letter to be written to CRA, giving the business reasons for why you want to change your year end. Okay, so I think you've heard enough of me and hopefully that's a lot of information. And again, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat, the Q&A for afterwards and, and we'll chat with them then. And I pass it over to Carly. Thanks, Tamara. So I'll now be running you through part two of our webinar, which will focus on the areas of compensation, common tax deductions, and other considerations. 
So to jump into compensation, Damara had already touched on this, but I'm going to go through the options for the different types of business structures. For sole proprietorship, there is only one option. Uh, the total net income or loss that's generated from your sole proprietorship um, will be taxed as business income on your personal tax return. As Damara had mentioned, you can't pay out to yourself a salary anyway. Anything that's just left over um, as the net income or loss from your company will go on your personal tax return and be taxed with any other personal income that you hold. However, it is important to note you can be paying other employees through a salary um, and you can expense that uh, through your business schedule. So it is possible to pay other people, you just can't pay yourself because effectively uh, the end total that you have in the company will be taxed on your personal return. An important thing to note is typically you might see on your personal tax return that your taxes owing balance is higher as a result of having your sole proprietorship reported on a business income schedule. And this might just be a result of you paying into CPP. Um, partnerships are the next one. Um, and the option is pretty similar to um, sole proprietorships. Um, as Demir had mentioned, you pick up your portion of the partnership, uh, the net income or loss on your personal return if you're an individual. And if you're a corporation, you would pick it up on your corporate tax return. If you are a corporation, um, you will receive the T5013, which just shows you your percentage allocation of that partnership income. So same thing, picking that portion up on your returns. For corporations, however, there are two different options. For compensation, you can either pay yourself out a salary or a dividend. Uh, Demera also had mentioned that this is a, a great vehicle um, having, having a corporation uh, set up as your structure because you can retain excess funds within the corporation. Um, you're paying lower tax rates and you're able to defer some of those uh, funds and defer taxes to another period. Um, so having a corporation allows you to make the decision when you want to pay out salary or dividends, or if you want to pay out one or the other or a combination of both. Um, I will get into a bit of a discussion of what some of the pros and cons of each are, but I just want to draw your attention to the table. Um, there's a lot of check marks sitting on salary, but that doesn't necessarily mean that salaries are better than dividends. It really depends on your situation and what your objectives are. Um, so with the salary, uh, this option is favorable if you're interested in paying into CPP. So if you pay a salary, you must uh, remit deductions uh, for the Canada Pension Plan. So if you're interested in receiving that when you retire, um, a salary payment will make sure that you're contributing to that. It also allows you to build RRSP contribution room, which is your retire registered retirement savings uh, plan. So if you're also interested in contributing to that and you want to receive some of that when you retire, paying a salary allows you to build up that contribution room so that you can make contributions. Another thing to note for salaries is it is often considered as earned income when you're calculating um, the eligibility for many programs and benefits as opposed to dividends. Um, so if you have, say, a ton of childcare uh, expenses and you want to deduct that on your personal return. If you pay a salary, it's included as part of that calculation of earned income that allows you to deduct childcare expenses. Whereas if you are paying dividends and no salary, uh, dividends aren't considered earned income, so you wouldn't be able to deduct childcare expenses. Um, you also have the ability with the salary, as Demer had mentioned, to record and accrue bonuses in your corporation. Um, so you record them in the period, but you don't have to pay them out right away. You have up to 180 days after year end to pay them out. So you can accrue them, um, record them as an expense in the current year, and then pay them out um, within 180 days of the next year. So it allows you to do a little bit of splitting that way. The downfall, however, um, on salaries would be that you, have, you are required to withhold and remit source deductions to CRA uh, based on your filing frequency. And if you don't pay those um, and remit those on time, you will be charged interest and penalties. So there is a bit of uh, an onus on you to make sure that you're filing on time. For dividends, um, most people choose this option because it's easy, it's flexible, you have the ability to income split. Um, you can make one payment once during the year. Um, it's easy to plan around. Um, 
And income splitting, what I mean by that is when you structure uh, your corporation, you can issue different classes of shares to different shareholders so that you only need to pay out dividends to say one class of share, which, which may have just one shareholder. So you don't have to pay to every single shareholder. Um, so there is the ability to plan around that. Um, the nice thing about dividends is that there's no uh, remittance requirements for source deductions. The only thing that you have to make sure that you're filing is your T-slip uh, the following year by the end of February. Um, but some of the unfavorable things on dividends is that if you're paying a dividend out, it may not count as earned income for certain programs. Uh, some of the things that come to mind are maternity leave. Uh, you do need to be paid like a salary as part of earned income in order to be eligible for that. So dividends don't count that way. Um, and certain other deductions, like I had mentioned, child care deductions, if dividends aren't included in the earned income calculation there. Um, you also want to watch, there was new rules put in place uh, called TOSI for tax on split income, if you've heard of that. Um, and it basically eliminates the ability to pay non-active family members in the business a dividend um, at a favorable rate. So you want to watch if you're paying out dividends to a non-active family member because you don't want those dividends to be paid at the highest tax rate. Um, and finally, when you're paying dividends, uh, you're not paying into CPP and you're not building your RSP contribution room. So these are some things you just wanna look at when you're planning salaries versus dividends. Um, you wanna understand what your situation is and which one would be best for you um, and consult uh, with your accountant if you need further advice to determine uh, which one is best for you. As I had mentioned, uh, with salaries, you're required to remit source deductions. So some of the common source deductions that you would be required to calculate and remit would be CPP, Canada Pension Plan, um, and that's required on individuals that are employed up to the age of 65. Uh, you don't, you're not required to remit CPP on the first $3,500 of salaries paid. Um, and you max out in 2022 on your contributions at about $3,500. So that's about 65K um, of salary. So once you go over that, you don't have to continue to rent, remit CPP in the current year since you've topped out. You're also, as an employer, required to remit employment insurance, or EI, at 1.4 times the amount that's calculated. Um, and you'll also be remitting uh, taxes withheld, which can be calculated, as I have noted, on the CRA Payroll Deductions Online Calculator. This is available to anyone. It's a really handy tool that I've seen used many times. Um, it helps you out with the calculations. You just have to put in certain details of like filing, uh, sorry, payroll frequency, et cetera. Um, and then it'll help you with the calculations. So if you just Google that one, it's easy to find. Um, and remittances are required based on uh, whatever agreed upon frequency that you have with CRA. Um, often it is bi-monthly, but it can also be monthly or quarterly. Uh, moving into the next topic of common tax deductions. This is an area we always chat about. Um, so some of the, the first common deduction I'm going to discuss is uh, automobile expenses. Um, so for all, in, all types of structures, um, it is important to note that you cannot claim uh, business use of vehicle for your travel from your home to the office. Um, and for all entities, you must keep a logbook of your business versus personal mileage. So what that looks like is you wanna make sure that you're tracking your starting kilometers for the year and your ending kilometers for the year. So you can tell the total kilometers that you drove in the year. And you also wanna keep track of the business kilometers that you traveled during the year. So it's good to keep in your log, the date that you traveled for business, a little description of it, the number of kilometers, just so you have all that information ready. We we'll oftentimes see that automobile expenses are reviewed. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have the support for that that's showing um, those details. So to break it down into uh, the different structures, uh, sole proprietorships and partnerships, um, automobiles are defaulted as personally owned. Um, so you're allowed to claim a portion of the mileage and the vehicle expenses that pertain to business use. 
So with that log, you will take uh, the amount of kilometers that were used for business, divide it by your total kilometers, and that's the prorated portion that you can claim of certain expenses like gas, insurance, repairs, et cetera. Um, it's also important to note that there is a capital cost allowance restriction uh, for these types of vehicles. So just to make sure you check into that before you're claiming CCA on these items as well. When looking at it from a corporate corporation standpoint, um, it depends whether the vehicle is company owned or personally owned. If the vehicle is company owned, the company may deduct uh, automobile expenses that are related to its operation. Again, there is capital cost allowance claim restrictions in place for passenger vehicles. You can only uh, claim a certain amount of costs. So you'll want to make sure you're looking into that and claiming a proper amount there. Um, in a company, however, there will be a taxable portion for your current or for your personal use. Um, and this shows up as a taxable benefit on a T4 to yourself. Um, and those calculations would be called a standby charge and an operating benefit. So it's the same type of thing as if you were a sole proprietorship or a partnership. They are going to um, have some portion that is related to you personally. So that would go as a taxable benefit on a T4 so that you're taxed personally on your personal portion. Um, they're like the standby charge and operating benefit do have a bit of a calculation behind it. So you'll make sure that you wanna check into that if you do have a company owned vehicle to make sure that you're calculating those properly. If the vehicle is personally owned, uh, the company can pay out a tax-free allowance to the owner of the vehicle, and this expense is deductible to the company. However, CRA does have a bit of a requirement around what is a reasonable allowance. Um, and in order for it to be reasonable, they say that you need to pay out the allowance based on a certain rate per kilometer. So you'll still track your business use um, and you will pay out for 2022, you're allowed to pay uh, 61, cents per kilometer for the first 5,000 kilometers. And then anything after the 5,000 kilometers for business use will go uh, to the rate of 55 cents. However, you can choose to pay out if you say, hey, like I just wanna pay out $500 a month. I'm not following the rates. I'm just gonna do a set amount. You can do that and it is deductible under the company, but it will also be taxable uh, to the individual. So it is much better to be paying it out based on what CRA finds reasonable and based on uh, these set rates. So it's just important to, to note that so that you're not getting double hit on it. Um, and just as a side note, there are lease and interest um, deductions available if you are leasing a vehicle. It's a bit of a calculation there. Um, so just to be aware of that, if you do need to calculate that uh, for your tax returns. The next item we're going to touch on is capital cost allowance on uh, capital expenses. Um, and this is equivalent to uh, what amortization would be for accounting terms. Basically, uh, when you purchase any asset that has a long lasting benefit or an advantage, you can pull the expense in over time, like a portion of the expense over time, rather than expensing the full amount at one time. Um, so CRA's definition, uh, a capital expense that gives gives a lasting benefit or advantage. Lots of times we see companies have computers, automobiles, equipment, building, anything that's like over the, the test that we stay at about $500 cost is something you wanna look at capitalizing and bringing into income, or sorry, into expenses for a portion over time, like 30%, et cetera, et cetera, based on the, the C, CCA class rates. Um, rather than, than expensing it all in one year. So you can incur the benefit of that uh, for several years. There is information, um, if you just Google CCA classes um, and rate information, you can see what type, of, um, what type of assets fall into each of the classes, which is helpful to know. And you can also see the rate that it's coming in on and being expensed. Um, you will note things like buildings obviously come in at a much lower rate, um, like two to 6% per year. Um, whereas something like uh, computers come in at a much quicker rate just because they're assumed to be used up quicker, but they're still coming in at more of a prorated base than, than expensing something major all in one year. Uh, the next item to touch on of common deductible uh, expenses is home office expenses. 
And this um, pertains to all business structures, uh, whether it be partnerships, uh, sole proprietorships or corporations. In order to be eligible to claim home office expenses, um, you must meet one of the two tests. The workspace must be your principal place of, of business or you must use your workspace exclusively for earning income from business and use it regular for meeting with your clients or customers. So um, the calculation for including home office expenses um, is on a prorated basis. You have to think about um, what the square footage of your home office space is divided by the total square footage of your home. However, if you fall under the category where your workspace at home is also used uh, personally, say you use your whole ba basement for your workspace, but you know after hours you use it as an entertainment place and it's not like a separate spot for your business, um, then you also have to prorate that calculation further by the number of hours in a day used for business use divided by the total number of hours in a day. So it is good to have a, a dedicated workspace that you don't have to prorate further. Um, a note for sole proprietors is that you um, can claim home office expenses up to the point that it makes your net income zero. You can't create a loss from claiming um, home office expenses. So if you have way more home office expenses and it's going to put you in a loss, that amount can be carried forward to future years and you can deduct it in future years against your net income. You just can't create a loss with home office expenses. Some of the common home office expenses that we see being prorated and, and used on returns are things like heat, hydro, your insurance, um, any maintenance costs on your home, property taxes, um, mortgage interest. Um, those are some of the common ones we see. However, just as a side note, um, telephone and cell phone typically don't fall into home office expense, but they are an allowable deduction um, for your companies. So just making sure that you're putting a prorated uh, percentage of, of your um, telephone or cell phone as an expense. And typically we don't see 100% being claimed because there is some sort of personal aspect to it. So um, just making sure you're selecting a reasonable percentage to claim if you're deciding to claim any telephone or cell phone expenses. Um, the, no the next topic is limited expenses. Uh, CRA has a couple of these expenses here that they have specific restrictions on that it's always good to be aware of. The first one is meals and entertainment. Um, CRA states that you can only claim 50% of the costs as an expense, as well as 50% of the related GST on your GST return for any meals and entertainment. So um, if you're taking clients out, just making sure that you're tallying up your bills at the end of the year and you're only claiming 50%. I do believe on the 21-25 schedule, there's a spot for the total and then it'll automatically claim out or take out 50% for you on it. But if it doesn't, then you just need to make sure that you're only claiming the 50% and that goes for the GST along with it. Um, with entertainment, that would be things like uh, if you're buying tickets to sporting events, um, gala tickets, anything like that. And the next limited expense that CRA has is golf fees. Um, they don't allow any green fees or anything like that to be deductible in any business structure for tax purposes. So just making sure even if you're justifying that you're using uh, your golf membership to meet with clients, it's still not allowed to be deducted. So that wraps up the discussion on common deductions. A lot of info there, a lot of common things that people see. Um, I will now move on to the last part where we have some other considerations of a few miscellaneous items to address. Um, as Demera had mentioned, the lifetime capital gains exemption. Um, so this is an exemption that you are, are is available to people on a tax-free basis. Um, and in 2022, the maximum was nine, 913K. So basically what this means is if you personally own shares in a qualified small business corporation and you sell these shares, the capital gain um, that is generated from the sale of these shares may be um, eligible for the lifetime capital gains exemption um, up to an amount of $913,000. Um, so it is a big thing. Um, 
However, in order to qualify for this, you need to make sure that the corporation that you own shares in meets the certain tests to be qualified as a qualified small business corp. Um, so that's something you definitely want to consult uh, with, with an accountant there to make sure that they're meeting the tests um, to make sure that you're eligible for this capital gains exemption, um, which will save you lots of tax. Um, on top of that, there's also um, an additional amount for qualified farm or fishing property of 86K, which tops you up to the million. So if you own qualified farm or fishing property, you have a lifetime capital gain exemption amount of what? $1 million, where potentially the capital gain, if you sold the land and you had a capital gain of up to a million dollars, you would be able to receive that tax free. However, with qualified farm and fishing property, there's also certain tests that need to be met on the qualified farm property. It needs to be farmed for a certain amount of years. It has to pass down uh, intergenerationally, et cetera. So you'll make sure that you consult on, on these types of properties as well to make sure everything's on side. Um, if you are planning to sell in the future and just to make sure that the tests are being met at, the, at this point in time to make sure that you would be eligible uh, for this exemption if you do own these items. Uh, the next topic is government programs. I won't touch too much on this uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happening. There was tons of relief programs that were available. Lots of them are wrapping up. Um, however, we did note um, in a recent article that um, if you did have the Canada Emergency Benefit Account, aka the CBA loan, um, they've extended the repayment um, up to December 31st of 2023. So giving you a bit more time to pay back the amount and get the um, either the 10K or the 20K forgiven. So just a note on that. Um, but I won't touch too much more on the COVID programs because they're starting to wrap up a little bit more. There is more information online if you do uh, end up Googling it. However, as uh, new companies uh, or startups, just wanted to throw this out there that there are additional uh, government programs and uh, provincial and federal funding for several new startup type initiatives. Uh, the governments always have some sort of funding. So just making sure that you're aware that you know, there's things for research and development companies, tech startups, entrepreneurs. So just making sure that you're looking into things like that if you're looking for funding. And uh, our final topic of discussion is other items. We just threw this one in here. We, we get lots of questions on this type of thing. Um, for bookkeeping, lots of people have asked us, uh, what's the best online or desktop accounting program to use? And really it depends on your complexity of your business and the transactions that you're, that you're having run through your company. Some of the common ones that we see are QuickBooks Online, Sage, Xero, and even Excel. Um, it does depend, as I said, on the complexity of your business. If it is an easy business that, you know, it only has a couple lines of revenue or a couple transactions in a year, maybe Excel is the easiest way to track things. Um, we are seeing in this day and age move to digital platforms. So we're seeing a lot of the QuickBooks online, zero, that type of thing. Um, and there is functions that allow you to loop in your accountant so they can view the information and help you out that way too. So uh, that's what we see from a bookkeeping standpoint. Um, some of the reports that we find important when it comes to tax time, whether you're preparing it or you have your bookkeeper prepare it, um, making sure that you have a general ledger, AKA a listing of all the transactions that occurred during the year, a formulated balance sheet and an income statement of all the activity that happened as well during the year um, and keeping track of all of that type of information. So it's easier to prepare your, your tax returns at year end. And finally, record retention. Um, it's just important to note that CRA uh, requires that you keep uh, track of your records for seven years or six years after your tax year end. So making sure you have a good filing system there and you're, you're holding on to records for that amount of time because they are able to come back and audit anything from that time period. So just making sure that you have good records in place. And that concludes our, our content for today. I'd like to thank everyone for logging on. Uh, we had a blast delivering the content here. We're right in the middle of tax season. So um, these topics are fresh in our mind. Um, and we'd like to open the floor to any questions that anyone has. Um, I see that there's quite a few in the Q&A, so we'll just start tackling those.
want to open, can you open up the Q&A box there and we'll be able to go through them? Yeah, so I've got the first one on there and it says, is there a minimum requirement? Uh, this is from Jocelyn. Uh, is there a minimum requirement for gross revenue before you pay into CPP? So yes, yeah, so you have the $3,500 exemption before you have to start paying into CPP. And if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything to, if we didn't answer anything, or, or if you need a little bit more detail, feel free to enter more in the chat or to even pop on with your, your microphone and ask additional questions too. Um, the next question is from Jackie and it, it is, is there an opportunity to opt out of CPP as a self-employed person? If so, what are the positive and negative aspects of doing so? Specifically, I own an unincorporated business in which I pay myself a salary and receive a T4. Sorry, I own an incorporated business, not an unincorporated business. Um, yes, there is an ability to opt out of CPP. I do believe there's a certain election form that you can file. Um, the negative aspect is that you wouldn't be you wouldn't be contributing to CPP, but if you were doing it on your T4 that you're being paid from your incorporated business, then you should be covered. Demara, did you have anything to add on that one? No, I think that's right. I think I want to say it's a CPT 30 form, but I could be wrong on that. Okay, so a uh, question from Lloyd. So if your corporation is registered to start in December, um, you said your end is always three months or June, is it not November 30th? So um, to clarify, I guess, Lloyd, so if you have a December 31st year end um, as a solo proprietor, um, like everything is on your calendar year. So if you're an incorporated business and you have a December 31st year end, your taxes may be due either February 28th or uh, March 31st. And then your tax return will be June, due June 30th. Um, and we have another question from Lloyd. How much would we pay if we roll out to corporate from sole proprietor? Um, I think what this one's getting at is if you roll into a corporation, um, as a sole proprietor, um, Demera had touched on this. Um, this is a bit more of a complex issue. Um, what happens is you roll into the corporation on a tax deferred basis uh, through a section 85 roll is what it's called in the Income Tax Act. There's tons of calculations there to make sure that you're electing in your assets at a certain value so that you can defer tax. Um, this is one that we might have to you know, take offline to have a bit more discussion around because it is a bit of a tricky topic to navigate around um, and it's different for every business. Um, but there are costs, if, if you're wondering what the legal costs are, there will be costs to incorporate that you'll have to pay to a lawyer um, and, and probably an accountant as well to do the calculations to make sure that you're filing the election um, to roll into a court properly. So I, I can't say exactly what the legal fees would be or the accounting fees, um, but I do know if it makes sense for you to roll into a corporation, you will recover those costs in your tax savings, you know, after a couple years um, of operation. So that's when they look at, um, when we look at giving advice on when to roll in, we wanna make sure that it is a benefit to you and you are gonna benefit from being in a corporation so that the, the costs to incorporate uh, make sense. Okay, and the next question is, is there a means to do your own bookkeeping and would, and would you suggest on how to do it? So absolutely. So Carly mentioned this. Um, there are many uh, cloud-based platforms right now that um, just seems to be the wave of the future along with a lot of different industries. Um, that are really helpful. So again, it's the QuickBooks Online, uh, Zero Sage, I think is an online platform as well. And so there are multiple tutorials that all of those bookkeeping uh, platforms have that you can take to be able to do your books on your own. They have some really great community support as well, uh, online support where you can write your question in and you can get answers from the community or you can search or there's different tutorials and, and videos and webinars and things like that. Um, so the cloud-based platforms have just exploded and they are just a huge resource. So you absolutely can do your bookkeeping on your own. 
it's really important to make sure that you understand the difference between like a balance sheet and an income statement and a debit and a credit because you're going to be doing those regular journal entries. Um, so think that's very important to, to keep in mind. And you know, if you don't have the time, like if your business is really exploding and, and you just don't have the time, you know, if you can, I always, you know, recommend get an accountant or get a, a good bookkeeper involved. Um, if you have a good bookkeeper, you're probably going to pay less than you would by bringing into your accounting firm and getting them to do the bookkeeping. Um, they're just more efficient and at a little bit of a lower rate. So that's something to keep in mind. And again, Carly mentioned, you know, with these cloud-based platforms, your accountants can now jump into your accounting software and actually look at your business throughout the year. Whereas in the past, you know, even when I started in the accounting world, you know, you're kind of reactive as an accountant because you're getting the financials at the year end. And now we can actually jump in and see how you're doing. You know, maybe you need a loan throughout the year. Well, we can go in and look at your books. These cloud-based platforms actually can link your bank accounts and we can see how you're doing. You know, do you need a loan? Is there a loan that you're going to need coming up? So you really can start planning better, which is some of, you know, the big opportunities of having those cloud-based platforms as well. Um, and the next question from Lloyd is what is the best, uh, what is the best way for us to get money from a corporation dividends or salaries and what are the tax implications? Uh, so we went through a bit of the differences between salary and dividends. Um, it is definitely a situation by situation um, basis that you have to look at it because it'll be different for different individuals and different corporations. Um, the tax implications, not to get too, too far into that, but salaries would be deducted as an expense in the corporation and would be taxed as, um, as an employment expense on a T4 for the individual. Uh, dividends work a little bit differently. Um, they are deducted after the fact uh, from a, they're deducted after the fact on a corporation and they um, get grossed up and you get a dividend tax credit. So that's a little bit more complex on, on how the dividends work on the personal side of things. Um, but it's looking at the benefits of dividends versus salary. Do you wanna pay the remittance? Is CPP and RRSP contribution room important to you? Um, who you're paying the dividend out to? Are they an active family member or are they inactive? All the things we kind of discussed in that slide with the pros and cons, that's where you wanna base your decision from. And I think that sort of answers, yeah, perfect, awesome. Um, so when would be the best time in a financial cycle to switch from dividends to salary for the owner of a corporation? Carly, do you wanna continue with that discussion? Sure. Um, I do believe that you can switch at any point or you can pay a combination of salary or dividends um, at any point. So there is no exact time in a cycle. Um, but if you're, you know, you might decide to finish up the year with salary and then go to dividends or, you know, consult with an expert um, or an advisor on what the best time would be for you personally based on your cir personal circumstances. Um, but at any time during the year, you definitely can switch that up depending on, on what your situation is. Tamara, did you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I only add that, you know, dividends are easier to adjust throughout the year um, because you're picking those up, you know, at the, the T5 deadline being February 28th. T4 is you just have to be cautious when you're paying a salary that you've got those remittance requirements that Carly was, was touching on throughout the presentation, that if you're paying a salary a month, those remittances are typically due by the 15th of the following month if you're on a monthly remittance schedule. So you just need to be aware that if you are paying a salary that you know when your remittances are due by so that you don't get caught with interest and penalties. Yes, that's a very good point, especially if you're running back and forth between the two, you're gonna to wanna to keep a good idea in your mind uh, when you need to remit your source deductions for your salaries. Okay, um, and we've got a long lasting benefit is a stamp uh, to be defined as a capital expenses and office equipment. So I think, I guess, I'm hoping I've got this right, that is office equipment considered a capital expense. And that depends on the type of office equipment. So again, it kind of goes back to that threshold. Does that office equipment have a long lasting benefit? You know, is it over sort of that $500 threshold? And if so, we're probably considered a capital item and depreciate that uh, office equipment over time as opposed to expensing it. 
And lots of time office equipment can be a bit of a tricky one just because maybe you're getting like a small thing like a computer mouse, we would say just expense it, you don't need to capitalize it. But like if you're getting something more like along the lines of a computer or a desk or something that's costing you a little bit more and you're going to use for a long period of time, that's when we would say that it's a capital expense, we would recommend that you're capitalizing it and taking CCA on it rather than expensing it all. But any small little items, um, definitely free to throw that through your expenses. There, there's no benefit of taking a couple bucks every year on small items. Um, the next question is, if you're under a sole proprietorship, what percentage of your profits need to be set aside for CPP for tax purposes, or is something um, an accountant can figure out based on profit, especially if you, if one already has a full-time job paying for CPP, I'm wondering how to separate it out. Yeah, so that one, Carly, do you want me to answer that one? For sure. Yeah, so I think what happens is that when you've got the sole, uh, sole proprietorship, proprietorship and you've got a 21-25 business schedule, when you're doing your tax programs and it's calculating, you know, it will allocate a portion of CPP. But if at the end of the day, based on your income, there is an overpayment of CPP, you will get that uh, overpayment of CPP back when you're preparing your personal tax return. So that will come out as well. And then you would get that uh, via way of refund when you uh, file your tax return. Perfect. The next question uh, from Ruba is, if you've started a sole proprietorship at the beginning of the year, let's say February, when will your quarterly taxes be due? So I do believe you mean like your, your taxes on your tax return. So if you started, say, this February, your taxes, like, or sorry, the profits in that sole proprietorship would be due on your next return since it is running through your 2022 year. So you would be required to pay any taxes in April of the following year, but your tax return is due June 15th, as Damara had mentioned. But just to make sure you're not caught off guard that you, it's probably a good idea that you file by the end of April. So if you do have any taxes showing that you're making the payment on time. And I think to add to that, so if you started in February of 2022 and you are over that uh, tax threshold, uh, I think of it, it's the $3,000, um, for taxes owing that are due April of 2023, you would start to have quarterly requirements. Um, I believe that falls in would be June 15th of 2023. Once you file that tax return, you'll have those quarterly requirements sort of that year right after you file. Um, our next question. So since liability is limited to the business for a corporation, any requirement for business insurance for the corporation? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of ours uh, incorporated businesses have business insurance and you might have different types of insurance depending if you have a building um, that's within the corporation that you've purchased within the corporation. So you might have some building insurance um, and have some business insurance. Um, I think there are different types of business insurance. So Obviously it's gonna depend on your type of business, but I don't think it hurts, but I would always talk to insurance providers as well to make sure that that makes sense for the business that you're in. That was a very good question on insurance. Mm -hmm. um, the next question from, question from Melanie is, if you claim your child childcare related deductions on your personal taxes associated with my day job, is there opportunity to claim any child related uh, through my corporation as well? Unfortunately, there is not. Um, if your corporation pays out you a salary and you're getting t Ford, then that's considered earned income. So that's where you can claim your child care deductions on your personal taxes. But it sounds like that's what's happening already. So no, I'm not aware of anything that can be claimed in a corporation. And I just want to make sure. So Ali, it looks like it is one o'clock. Do we just want to get through the rest of these questions in the panel right now? and wrap up, is that the idea? Yeah, it's up to you guys. It looks like we have seven questions here. So if we wanna get through these last seven, we'll just cap it at that. Yeah, let's do that, That absolutely. Okay. Uh, so our next question is, so uh, I likely missed this due to join late. That's perfectly fine. So I have a year end of September 30th. Is it possible to change it to a December 31st year end? So uh, if you, yeah, so it sounds like you're incorporated, Melanie. So absolutely you can, you have to have a business reason for wanting to change your rent to December 31st. 
And then what you can do is you can write a letter to CRA um, telling them why you need to change your business year end, um, that business reason for it. You submit it to CRA and they will write you a letter back indicating if they've accepted that reason and you can now change your year end. Um, or if they come back and say for some reason you can't. And then what happens is that you may just have a stub year end depending when they get back to you when that's going to be effective. So you just want to watch that, um, that you might have maybe two tax returns in one year because you've got that short period. Awesome. The next question for Marie is, does your company take new clients for March 31st year end? If so, what is the process for new client onboarding? Um, yes, we are we are always looking for new clients and taking on new clients. Um, I would say your best process for this um, is our contact details will be in the next slide and available to you uh, after the presentation. So if you wanted to reach out to us that way, and we'll make sure we connect you with the right department um, and take a look at your, your info um, and can assess from there. Okay, so if you're running a sole proprietorship and you bought a car for the business, can you deduct the car loan 100%? So great question. Again, as Carly mentioned, you know, as a sole proprietorship, that car is owned by you personally. So again, you would be doing a proration. Um, you could deduct a portion of the loan interest, um, but that would be limited to what the percentage is for business, but not 100% of the car loan. Um, Steph asked, the credit card I use solely for business expense for my corporation has my personal name on it, not my business name. Is this an issue? Tamara, I might let you take this one. I think I've seen this before, but. Yeah, uh, Steph, that's a great question. It is very common. Um, we just always encourage, you know, get that corporate credit card in the corporation's name. So that's okay. You know, if you are using that personal credit card 100% for business, you just want to make sure that you're tracking that. Um, if you've got an accountant or bookkeeper that they know that and they're just monitoring it. And that again, if you have any personal expenses on there that you're incurring that you back those out and you don't include those. So it's not an issue. I would encourage you if you can get that corporate credit card. Um, if you're incorporated, that would be the best option for you. It just eliminates for the most part, you know, getting any of those persons, personal expenses in there, but it's not, it's not a big issue. Uh, the next question is from Kingsley. Uh, we can go from sole proprietorship to corporation. Can we go to corporation to sole proprietorship? This is a very unique question. We don't see this a whole lot in practice. Generally, we see the sole proprietor going to the corporation. Um, and then, you know, the funds are generating, you're generating a lot more funds. So that's why you're in the corporate structure. But I do believe, yes, you can dissolve your corporation and go back to sole proprietorship status. This would probably happen if you had you know, you had a really successful business over time and it's winding down, but you still want to do a little bit with the business, but you don't want to have that corporate structure. Um, you'll just have to go through the steps to make sure you dissolve that corporation um, and may need to set up like a new um, identifiers for the, the new sole proprietorship. Okay, so the next question is, how much is the threshold for a capital expense? Um, so again, that is sort of a, a personal preference. Uh, I would, you know, encourage you to look at the capital expense and the, the capital cost allowance uh, criteria that CRA has. Our rule of thumb, what we see typically for most of our clients is we say a threshold of $500 and above, we would consider a capital item. Um, but again, it sort of depends. You know, there might be something that you bought for $800 that maybe is a period cost. It's not going to have a long lasting life. So we would expense it. So again, it's kind of the 500 maybe is just that's a rule of thumb that we use in our practice. Um, but again, long lasting benefit. That's where if it you know, really has that long lasting benefit, that what I would consider as a capital expense. And our final question from Kingsley is what percentage can you deduct from common uh, office expenses such as heat, hydro, et cetera? So on this one, um, you have to do a bit of a prorated calculation. So your percentage would be based on uh, the square footage of your home office divided by the total square footage of your home. So that'll give you the percentage that you're allowed to deduct um, for those types of expenses. Thank you everybody for the great questions. Yes, it was an awesome session today. Yeah, we got some, we got a lot of questions there. That was great. Uh, thank you so much, Carly and Dumera, for giving us your lunch hour and going through that. Um, I really appreciated it. I know all of our viewers did as well. So thank you again for joining us.
And I just want to remind everybody that this webinar, it will be available for on-demand viewing by the end of today on our resource library. Um, I'll also email out a link to everybody tomorrow, so you'll be able to access that as well. And just a reminder that our next webinar, it is tomorrow at 10 a.m. It is our business plan basics uh, workshop. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do. You can do that at west.ca slash events. And thank you again, Carly and Tamara. Uh, and thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Ali. Thank you.